Satan often comes across as someone that's more loving than Jesus. And then when Jesus speaks, it sounds harsh. And then these days, if we read the Bible, it's seen as hate speech. <laughs> hate speech. This book, which is a story of redemption of man, this book, which is based in love, is now full of hate speech, everybody. Because the enemy comes like the angel of light, pretending that he's something he's not. This is a book of love. This is a book of redemption. This is a book about how to establish the true God of all the universe as Lord of our life, where we should be. I tell you what, if, there was a, if you had a newborn baby, tell me where it's, where it's safer. By itself, in charge of its own life, running around in the cold today, or with Parents, a father and a mother. I tell you what, it's safer with a father and mother because it doesn't know how to look after itself. And we think we're so intelligent as mankind. We can look after ourselves, thank you very much, and reject our Creator and reject the Father. Because we'll be right because we think we're smarter. Isn't that the problem with, you know, the battle with parenting sometimes? It's always an interesting scenario to go, if you were in charge, what would you let happen? And very quickly, you can see how the whole household would fall apart in the hands of a child. Oh, we'd be able to use electronics all the time, we'd eat junk food all the time, we'd have to go to bed. Who knows? I mean, we know as parents that that's probably not a good idea. It's probably not healthy. And it might be fun for like the first two minutes. But beyond that, it's just going to be terrible. And you know, we're like that. We're as deceived as little children. We think we know all that. We know how to make things work. We can be in charge of this whole world and our life and eternity. And God's just like, oh my goodness, these kids. These kids. They think they're all that. I want to look after them. And some of us here will allow God to look after us. I'm going to allow God to look after me. And you know, like a loving dad, I know that when I slip up, and I do, that I just need to come to him because he is, he is love. If I ever need to question whether I've gone too far away from God, I just need to reflect on the sacrifice he made for my life. Would, I, would, would leaving eternal glory, paradise, so 100% unhindered communion with the Father, would you leave all that to come to earth with a message of salvation, the good news, get rejected, get tortured, and everything that happened throughout Jesus' life wasn't a pretty story? Would, would you prepared, be prepared to do that? Man, that's a big sacrifice. So I can rest, you can rest assured today, amen, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinning, Jesus looked at those that were mocking him and abusing him whilst dying a torturous death on the cross and he yelled out these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, thank goodness. Thank the Lord for that powerful release of redemption. That while I am acting out of stupidity in my own understanding of what I think is right, Jesus is calling out to my heart and goes, Father, forgive Thomas, he doesn't know what he's doing. And I admit, half the time I don't know what I'm doing. But the cool thing is, we're not called to be experts in God. We're called to be like little children. Little children. Unless you can come to God like a little child, you have no part. So it's like, that's cool. I'm really good at acting like a little child. So it's perfect for me. So I just come in my own way. It's interesting, this gospel is the most simple thing in all the world and you never stop learning. It's really cool. So I'm going to read something that might not be very history like but um, I'm, I just felt to read this passage of scripture from Luke chapter 14, verse 17, and I've titled this, Your Invited. It says, I'm reading from NIV, When one of those at the table with him heard this, uh, it's all about um, and this is not the point, so I'll just keep reading. It says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with the parable, right? Should have started this verse. 
A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. It's like, you know, these guys, you've been invited. Come now, it's, it's all good to go. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, uh, I'll just support a field and I've got to go and see it. So please excuse me. Another said, oh, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, oh, I just got a new iPad and uh, I'm just charging up and give it a go. Uh, sorry, I really can't, can't make it. Oh, yeah, that, that was an added bit. That wasn't, you can read that that wasn't scripture, but it would be in the message version or something. Probably. The, the updated version. Um, and, the, and still another said, oh, I've just got married. So, I can't come. What, you got better things to do when you just got married? <laughs> and the servant came back and reported this to, the, to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into all the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes. Another version says that where there's the hedges and things, so that my house will not be full. I tell you that not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Well, that seems pretty obvious to me. You're not going to get a taste of the banquet, even if you were invited, because you didn't come. <laughs> but the, the story here goes out, there's this, this appeal. Is there any lack of appeal on the master's behalf toward, to, toward anyone to come? There's no lack of invitation. There's no lack of appeal. It's going out and it's... And he's saying to his servants, go out further and further, keep looking, keep looking. You know, when it, when it says go out to the country lanes, um, the, the Jewish people didn't have that. He's talking about going out into the further parts of the world, anywhere you can find people, invite them. So the onus is not on whether we are invited or not. Who, the onus of if you get to eat at the banquet is what? The respondees. But is everyone invited? Yes. Does everyone have to come? No. And it seems really sad that because in, in this parable the master is, is reflective of God, the servants are reflective of God's messengers, his prophets, people have gone out uh, to share the good news. And then those that were originally invited were like the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Those that knew about the wedding feast, knew about the coming of Christ. And then everyone else, it's, it's just everyone in the whole world. So, the appeal is out there. I believe that there is an appeal of God to every heart and every man and woman and child across this earth. He says he reveals his glory through creation. If there's something in you that is looking for truth, truth will find you. I believe that sincerely. I believe that God puts appeal after appeal, like He does in this, as He reveals in this scripture, appeal after appeal after appeal. And it starts with the subtlety of my heart. Now, I don't know how well I will respond to the first, second, third appeal, but I just praise God that He kept appealing to my heart. Because <laughs> my heart is. It's not naturally yay for God. My, name, my heart is naturally selfish. I want to be the best. I, I want to... I, I'm inclined for people to worship me rather than me to be a worshipper. I, you know, outside of Christ, I can see that my part is just totally screwed up. I would fall in love with money. I would fall in love with all sorts of things. I would put my worship in all these types of things, including myself. I just become like an Aussie. Like a regular Australian. You know? 
that loves money, uh, is completely self-centered, um, you know, does things for me, me, me. I'd just be like everyone else, but the absolute miracle is that God appealed to my heart and appealed to my heart and appealed to my heart. And you know what? He enabled my heart to respond to Him, to say yes to Him. As you walk around on planet Earth, people of God, there's something of the Spirit of God that comes with you. There's something that changes the atmosphere around you. And people be drawn to it or, or run away from it. It's sad to think that you'd miss out on the kingdom of God, the great banquet, because you just got a new field, or you just got a couple of few oxen, or you just got, you know, or even if you just got married. I know that we've got so many excuses not not to devote our life to Christ, not to engage in His kingdom. There's so many distractions everywhere. But these distractions, when you look look back, when you think about your life as your, your body's about to die and you look back, you realise that the distractions are really worth it. You know, it goes on. I don't know if I should read one of the most controversial scriptures in the Bible um, because you might not like me and it will be seen as hate speech. <laughs> Jesus said it, so you can blame him. Okay, so straight after this it says, large crowds. This, you know, he's not a very good church builder, this Jesus. I mean, large crowds. I mean, this is good. Don't ruin it, Jesus. Your whole role is to, you know, save the whole world. But anyway, large crowds were travelling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Oh. You know, he's done this before. Oh, large crowds just got fed the 5,000 and then what did he say? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no part with me. And they all leave. And he looks at his disciples and goes, are you going to leave too? It's like, go on with the momentum. You could build a mega church here. This is great. Ah. Oh. And that comes and then he says, says these things. Have you heard of the word hyperbole? This is what I believe it is. It's a hyperbole. In other words, when Jesus said, another half scripture, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better for you to lose a hand than for your whole body to go into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Because it's better for you to lose an eye. And this, these are scriptures that Jesus said. Um, as far as I know, as I read throughout the rest of the Gospels and Acts and all that type of thing, I don't know of any example of people actually cutting off their hands and pulling their eyeballs out. Um, in fact, Jesus seemed to heal a lot of dysfunctional eyeballs by making blind people see and, and things like that and lame people walk. I mean, that was the heart of the attention. But what Jesus is trying to point out in that scripture and this scripture is that we got to get an idea of how valuable the kingdom of God is. It's worth more than your hand and your eye your whole life. It's worth more than your your mother, your father, your wife, your children, it's worth more than that. And if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate their father and mother, in other words, the gap between your love for something, between these things and him, needs to not even be near each other. When you follow Jesus, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's what he says. Keep it so fixed on Jesus and keep running that way. And you might have a wife or a husband and children, but in whatever situation and circumstance you're in, God is calling us to keep our eyes fixated on Jesus and going after Him. He doesn't want us to think we're following Jesus by looking over here and looking at me and looking over there. All these things which are seen as good things. Don't you agree? Because later in the Bible it says, you know, husbands love your wife. <laughs> later on it says, wives love your husbands and submit to them. 
you know, teach younger women, older women to love your husband and love your kids. All these things we know are from God. God loves family. But there needs to be the order put right. I remember I used to teach scripture at a really rough public high school. It was crazy. I remember in the breaks, I'd be just so exhausted, shattered. Like, whoa, man, what just happened? Maybe a fight broke out. Maybe a year 10 came in to try to fight a year 7. It was in my class. And, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. Other teachers would sometimes come in and... I thought, oh, I'll just watch how they deal with this because I've got no idea what you do when these things happen. She goes, get out! I'm like, no, oh, is that... Where are they supposed to go now? Find like someone else to match? Like, no, anyway. Um, anyway, there were some crazy times teaching in this rough public school and I remember walking around in breaks and thinking, yeah, I really am starting to understand that scripture where Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few because who would want to put up with this? <laughs> I didn't have to question the work. It was effective gospel work, but it was hard. Um, it's like you just do it by grace. Um, but so I, when I put this forward about how how you should love God the most, you go, oh, "What about your wife?" I'm like, "Well, if I love God with all my heart and all my soul, all my mind and all my strength, I'm going that way." Guess who's going to be a recipient of more love than they ever would have from me if I didn't go that way? My wife. I know what I'm like. I'm so glad God is number one in our marriage because I'm not that great a husband, to be honest. I mean, Brooke's great. <laughs> but I can get grumpy and tired and agitated. I need God, trust me. I need God for it to function. Because I, apart from, apart from God, it's, it's, not, it's not a pleasant thing to have at times. But if I'm someone that's devoted to Christ and I'm running after Him, you know, the fruit that comes from my life that other people see and pick is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self control. These are the fruits. The, the stuff that comes just out of our life when we follow God, when we're full of His Spirit and going after Him. And guess, guess who gets to eat that fruit from our life? Everyone that's around us. Who's the closest to you in your life? Your wife, your kids, whatever. They get to eat that fruit. I'm not going to bear much fruit outside of Christ. It says, abide. Jesus said, abide in me. Come and get grafted into me. Brooke and I was in Pemberton uh, last week or so, and then... We looked at some great finds. We saw actually how some some of them were actually grafted together. It was really cool. Never really bought the great finds before. Um, we saw how, so oh yeah, they can be grafted in. And it just gave me a real good picture of how we are supposed to be grafted in to the vine, grafted into Christ. As we do that, we will bear fruit that otherwise we wouldn't have borne. So yes, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his fruit, all these things. Such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And it says here, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you've got enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't you first sit down and consider whether he's able to with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he will send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off, and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses salt, it is not going to be made salty again. It's neither fit for the soil, nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears, let him hear. <laughs> this is the intention. It's so not our culture, is it? This way of following Christ is so not our culture. I think sometimes I might get drawn into it. I'm, I really want so many people to find Christ. This is the dilemma I have, right? I actually want everyone to have Christ. I mean, talk to you about it. You, you just want everyone to find Christ. It's like... You've got something, you know it's the best thing in all eternity, and you want other people to have it. But then, 
You might mention it or something, or even fully share the gospel, or just incrementally just, you might, and it's like no interest. It's like, that's weird. This is actually really important. So you can, if you get so desperate for people to enter into something that you have, you can widen the door. Go, oh, well, maybe if you just come in and try it. Just have a little sip. You know, maybe, you know, I know Jesus said that, you know, he's the foundation of our life, he's the rock that we build our house on. Maybe just for you, can he just be like a little stone and a little ornament that you put on your mantelpiece? Just try that out, because he's amazing. And then maybe when you taste that, you'll want to have him more in your life. It's like, no, the gospel is that narrow is the gate. It's only one way. And he needs to be Lord. We sang about that. He needs to be Lord. We can't get ourselves and save ourselves when we're Lord. And this is the problem. We desperately want to be Lord of our life. I know in my life, it's, I, I, I do want to take control. I have that temptation. But the whole design of the gospel is that he is king. And he is Lord. In other cultures, where they have many other gods, they do weird things to weird little statues and stuff. And they devote their lives and sacrifice and they come under the lordship of these meaningless, uh, voiceless gods. They devote their lives to these tiny little ornaments more than we do to the true God of all the universe sometimes. It's a real challenge to us. What would it be if we had a, 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 the, the followers of Christ, we really followers of Christ, what would it mean for my life if I let God be God? Lord of all. Lord of my decisions. Lord of every department of my life. What would that look like? And I know intellectually we know that that would be the best way. But sometimes we get scared into thinking what that might mean. Oh no, what if God asked me to sell my house? What if God asked me to move to another country? What if? And so we put these what ifs out there and then we go, okay, let's just squash that down. Because it says, he that has ears will hear what he's, what, he's, what he's saying. Be sensitive. God is speaking to us in whispers. And it's very easy to drown out the voice of God according to our own, what we really want. We can drown it out. But God wants us to be so sensitive to Him. To listen and go, you know what? Okay, God. And He takes us on a journey. And He walks with us like He did in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. He wants to work with us. He wants to journey with us. He wants us to do what kids do with a good dad. Jump off something and He'll catch us type of thing. He just loves that type of thing. It gives you joy when my, when my kids are smaller. They're too heavy now and they hurt me. If they, they, and I've told this story before, I'll be walking around, I know they're in a moment. And when they get a bit bigger, they jump in and climb on top of things and they're trying to leap on me. I'm like, oh, you're trusting me too much. And I, I really don't want to be injured by you right now. I've got things to do. But when they're smaller and, you know, they're younger, when they first jump and totally trust you, that kind of is pretty cool. And you know, with God, it's kind of like... When we trust him, when we take a leap of faith, it's, and when we do it, it's just like, oh, that's really cool. My kid loves me, and he really trusts me. And that's what we're called to be and do. And we're all invited. There's no special, you know, case like, oh, you, you fit the bill, you know, you're, you can be a Christian because you're that type of person. There's no type of person. We're all unique and different. Random, and we need all people to be different. I got totally different gifts to other people and stuff. That's great. I wouldn't want anyone else to be like me. That would be really annoying. But um, you just be you. You are qualified in Christ because He rose from the dead to be a recipient of the invitation. Just go to that first slide again, just to let it sink in. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited on this journey with Christ. It may look dramatic. It may look very sinful. Following Christ is not like in the old school days. If you're following Christ, you automatically have to go in the 
traditional ministry or go overseas or it's just journeying with him with whoever you've got around you taking steps of faith you know the father of our faith just go to the last two slides and I'll try and finish like this is the story we're up to in uh, the Bible story time I had with my kids and this is what we're going to get for the next term. Heaps more of these. Some of the kids already have them. We're going to study the Action Bible. And it's not a word-for-word -word translation, but, uh, you know, not like many translations, like the Passion Translation and the Message and things like that. But it gets the overall story, right? So this is what we looked at. And, and you can see, like, in this story with Abraham, is a foreshadow of what Jesus, God, did for us. So he needs to make a sacrifice, and his son's coming along, and we're confused, and then... He goes to actually sacrifice his son. Fully trust God to kill his son, right? As a sacrifice. Because that's what God wanted him to do. That's, follow, that's what it is to follow Christ. Is that crazy or what? Is that crazy? Yeah. It's crazy. Would you do that? No. So it's also another confusing. I'm like, no way. At least I'm being honest. Everything starts with honesty. You know, there's a scripture that Jesus says in the Bible. It's like someone said, um, oh, can you help me in, in the vineyard and, and work for me? And one person said, yeah, sure, no problem. The other one said, no, I don't want to. Anyway, the one that said yes didn't turn up. The one that said no, changed his mind and held out. And Jesus goes, well, who, who would he be pleased with? Well, obviously the one that said no and then turned up anyway. You know, well, I look at that and I think, no. But maybe God will do something in my heart later on that would enable me to say yes, I don't understand the possibility, but Abraham was the father of faith, it was accredited to him as righteousness, he was the one that literally jumped off something and allowed God to catch him. It says in Hebrews that he knew that the promise was in that son. The promise was in, in that son. Hebrews said, well, Abraham thought that maybe God could raise him from the dead or something. He didn't know, but he even put his hope in some crazy rationale that required incredible miracles. And in a sense he did Raise him back from the dead. If you look, God said, it's fine. I've provided a sacrifice for you. See, he didn't actually that sacrifice Isaac. God was just testing his heart. He set up a nation through him. They burn a ram, stuck in the thicket, and sacrificed that. What a learning experience for Isaac. What a learning experience for Abraham. It was, oh my goodness. But you know what? Someone did actually go through with this. And that was God himself. He did sacrifice his son. And like Abraham thought, because he had the mindset of faith, he was a father of faith, Abraham thought, well, maybe he will raise Isaac from the dead or something. I don't know. Not that it any, anyone had been raised by the dead at that point. Jesus did rise from the dead. And he became the living sacrifice for us. But Abraham showed us what following Christ is all about. What finally God's all about. And trust me, I'm not speaking as one that does it well. But the intention of my heart, which is very important, wants to follow Christ like that. I do not have the ability to do it. I couldn't do what Abraham did. I, I can't live like these people did. But the intention of my heart is to go, come on, Lord, take me on a journey. I want to love you more. I want to trust you more. I want to follow you more. The intention of our heart is very important in how we respond to God. I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It is a love story. It is a book to give us life. And I thank you, Lord, that you have invited all of us to come and join you in this beautiful kingdom that you have opened a way for us to come into. Thank you, Lord, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive and well and can live within us. And I pray that anyone that has any sense of condemnation, any sense of guilt, any sense that I would not be invited, I rebuke those stupid thoughts in Jesus' name, those dark thoughts. And I thank you, Lord, that you have invited us. You've searched for us. You've found us and you've invited us to come and share in your kingdom. And I pray for the courage to stand in you. Help us to live in the world but not of the world. I pray that our mindsets would be on you and not on the things of the world. And 
We thank you, Lord, that although we know in our own strength that's impossible, by your grace it is possible. In Jesus' name. Amen. I was talking to Brooke yesterday, as I do sometimes. She's my wife. And um, I think it was, it was saying, I don't know what context was, something about church or something. Um, oh, preaching, are you ready for tomorrow? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Oh, am I ready? Am I ever ready? I don't know. Um, oh, you know, you, you know, you'll do good, you do good. I go, yeah, no, but I don't say that, because they'll go, yeah, yeah, I've got it, I've got it. And then God's grace goes, and they'll like a complete fool. And I said, but I look really good in God's grace. I look really good in God's grace. That sounds really weird, doesn't it? But it's true. Me, just me, a man. I look good in God's grace. <laughs> you? Yeah, you're okay. But man, <laughs> you look good in God's grace. God's grace looks really good on you. Trust me. The way that it changes your face, the expressions of light that comes out of your life for you. You look good in God's grace. Let's live in God's grace and keep following Him in that. Amen? Bless you. Happy Easter Sunday.